All right, we're live. Okay, my name is Jeremy Seek. I'm uh, sort of the original primary author of the Blue Scraft Library, uh, among other things. I have to thank uh, Doug Greger, who was up there earlier, for, for sort of prodding me and bringing me out of retirement uh, to come and talk with you guys today. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor down at uh, CU Boulder. Um, I've been waiting through the tenure process. If you guys have heard what that's like. Um, and uh, what else what have I been doing since the scrap library stuff? I was very much involved with the uh, concepts language feature extension. Um, the, uh, my, uh, my PhD thesis was very much sort of all about sort of setting the groundwork for, for the concepts proposal. What's that? Am I in the wrong room? No, you're probably in the right room. Is this fluid? I'm just. Uh, Are you? I, I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. Here's if the other hall was packed. Right. Let me go over and check. Okay. Let's see. Okay. We'll we figure out what's going on. Here. Yeah. So, so I've um, so with the looking into the whole concepts proposal, my my interests right now are, are sort of more on the programming language and language design side of things. Uh, though my overarch overarching goal is to make uh, programming languages better for libraries. And better for domain specific languages and, and things like that. So, um, that's, some, that's sort of like long term research. Uh, but let's talk about uh, enough about me. Um, sort of the next hour, is it hour and a half? Yeah. Um, I basically want to do an introduction to generic programming. It's, you can't really understand the graph library if you don't have a good basis in generic programming. And do a little bit of a, just a discussion of you know, the design of the, of the Boost Graph Library. Why does it look the way it looks? And um, please stop me and ask questions at any time. Um, the, I mean, in some sense, the main, some of the main points I want to get across here is the rationale, the why, behind a lot of the design decisions. And, and I don't claim they are all perfectly correct. I mean, we can now, with a little bit of time on our hands, we can look back and say, oh, well, Maybe I would have done it differently now in hindsight, or or maybe oh no, this one really does make sense, and then but the reasons might not be obvious to everybody, and then maybe I'll be able to chime in and say, hey, you know, this is this was the reason, and and give sort of a good cogent explanation for that. Um, and I mean, part of the reason why this is particularly important is that you know the Boost Graph Library doesn't look like a lot of other libraries out there. I mean, maybe now it's starting to look. I mean, there's Compared to other boost libraries, there's a lot of similarity, right? Because uh, in a lot of the boost libraries also are you know, trying to support generic programming. But if you if you are you know, looking at some of the older, more object-oriented style libraries, or even some of the modern libraries today in, in other languages like Java, there will be quite a bit of a difference. And and you might be wondering like, why why is it different? You know, why why is it you know kind of you know very strange? So so maybe I can help answer some of those questions. And then we're also going to look a little bit at uh, using the Boost Graph Library to solve some problems. So that'll be a little bit more of a hands-on, well, not exactly hands-on, but more of like, okay, as if you're coming from the perspective of wanting to use the Boost Graph Library, uh, maybe that'll, that part will be of interest to you. And again, please stop me at any time to ask questions. Uh, I think I have about 60 slides. Okay. Well, thank you all for... Uh, being flexible and switching over here. This is nice and cozy over here. That's good. Um, so where does generic programming come from and what is it? Um, so generic programming, it, I'm going to stress that it's a methodology for developing software libraries. Um, you'll often hear the term generics, generic programming, kind of get, kind of get mixed up with, with things like language features, like so templates or what's called generics in Java or particular language features. And sometimes I think people sort of get the methodology and the language features sort of mixed up. They're sort of two different things. You can, you can do generic programming the methodology whether or not there's generics in the language. Maybe harder. Uh, <laughs> you know, in some sense, C++ only has partial support, I would say, for doing generic programming right now, uh, so which does make it harder. Um, uh, and other languages actually have better support for doing generic programming. Uh, but really, what I'm going to be talking about mainly is the methodology 
uh, and then in places where that sort of ties into particular language uh, features. So the, the big idea, and this, this is the, the idea that you know, Stepanov had in the, when he got sick, that you can read about it in one of those interviews, uh, I think it was a stomach flu or something, uh, that when you're trying to implement algorithms, you really want to make minimal assumptions about the data structures that you're working on. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's sort of no surprise that Stepanov was a, it was a mathematician. Because uh, mathematicians have been doing this for a long time. Well, they're not quite so much concerned with what we think of as algorithms, but the theorems in mathematics, uh, in some sense, are very similar in structure to what we think about as algorithms. And you want your theorems to be reusable. Okay, and, and to do that, you, you decouple your theorems from the particular things that they're about, and instead you build these new abstractions. Uh, that the theorems can talk about. And that's, it's, and that's what Stepanov was saying, hey, we need to use that same idea. We need to decouple our algorithms from the things that they're about. In computer science, our, you know, our algorithms are about you know, work over data structures. Okay? And so the idea here was that he's going to insert this abstraction, the iterator abstraction, in between. Okay? Now, this isn't the only abstraction. Uh, you know, and in fact, we'll see more examples of abstractions today. Uh, than just iterators, but the key idea here is that you know you want to isolate sort of what are the minimal things that the algorithm needs to know about, and then turn those into abstractions, and then that's going to allow you to use the same algorithm with lots of different data structures and make it much more reusable. Okay, and of course the standard template library is the sort of primary example uh, of this style of programming. So just uh, a little bit of contrast, you know. Kind of let's go back in time and think about how libraries were built, and actually still are built uh, in, in a lot of places using sort of object-oriented style uh, design. You'd, it'd be very common to see some, some classes like a vector or a list class, these container classes, and you just got like a, a, a giant list of functions as methods in these classes. Right? So you might have merge and reverse and sort. As, as methods of a class. And when you do it this way, you, let's say we have uh, like M algorithms that we care about. <coughs> Suppose we have N data structures, right? So vector, <coughs> list, maybe singly linked, doubly linked, you've got your hash tables, you've got your, your uh, red black trees, all that good stuff. <laughs> When you think about the amount of code that you have to write to implement all this stuff, it's, it's m times n, right? It's a huge amount of code to support all of that, all that functionality. Um, and so how can we, you know, in some sense, generic programming is all about sort of reducing this code, you know, something more manageable. Uh, so with the generic programming approach, we don't try to put the algorithms as methods. Instead, we try to pull them out as these separate, highly reusable uh, algorithms that can be used with multiple different kinds of container classes. And as you can kind of, as what's hinted at in the names of these template parameters here is that they're going to be implemented in terms of iterators. And then each of these container classes exports iterators. And now you can plug and play, right? You can use vector with merge, you can use list with reverse, and you just plug and play and you get your, your m times n functionality, but with only m plus n code. So that's a sort of a drastic reduction in the amount of code you need to write. Well, so that's, that's fantastic. We use much more time for hiking uh, here in Aspen. <laughs> so I, just, uh, I've been up here since Friday, and we, went, we tried to go to the Maroon Bells, which is just an absolutely gorgeous mountain up there, but the road is closed. It's for this, it doesn't open until the end of May, so it's, you can't get all that close to it without. Though if you have a bicycle or rent yeah. a bicycle, that's definitely the way to go, because then it's, it's a beautiful uh, bike ride up, up the uh, Maroon Creek uh, road there. All right, um, so, so, so far we've sort of seen the benefits of sort of writing reusable code in generic programming. And that's, that's, in some sense, that's the primary benefit that you're looking for with generic programming. But the other sort of main <coughs> sort of goal that we have when we're doing generic programming is efficiency. And this might come as sort of a surprise to a lot of people. Like, 
it's there's sort of this common perception that abstraction and efficiency sort of like conflict with one another that there's some sort of deep-seated conflict and there's no way to get both and in some sense history is sort of supported that claim you know you in many of the places where you see lots of abstraction being used you also see low performance um, and so it was actually pretty radical when the standard template library came out and people started doing performance tests with it and they're like whoa, this is pretty fast. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to claim that in every possible situation the STL is as fast as you could be in terms of hand-coded, but there's an awful lot of situations where it's either just as good or within a few percentage points. <coughs> and that's despite having tons of abstraction going on here. Okay, and so, you know, why, why is it that we're all of a sudden we're, we're somehow resolved this conflict between abstraction and, and performance? Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, this, the C++ language design and the way templates work. Uh, so here's perhaps the simplest little generic uh, function you could think of, the min function. And you know what happens when you call the min function with you know one comma two? Um, you know the the compiler produces the code on the right here, instantiates it with the particular types. And it then, it then does optimizations with these particular types in mind. You know, it may, it may inline things, you know, it's, here it's doing integer specific operations. So there's no runtime overhead for having all of this abstraction. So that's sort of the key. You, know, you, you have your, in some sense, the abstraction is there at compile time. It's there f from sort of a design perspective, but it's not there at, at the runtime. Now, you know, there's, you know, whenever you sort of, you never get anything for free, right? And so what's the cost of this, right? Well, here's the cost. <clears throat> and you probably all know this really well. We have some pretty long compile times in C++, okay? Um, and that, that is the cost of our high efficiency. There's no way around it. There's no way to get super low compile times and, um, you know, and highly efficient code. That's just sort of, that's, that's reality. That's where the, that, that, that is where the rubber meets the road. Um, but at least we've gotten rid of that old sort of idea that as soon as you had abstraction, uh, you were sort of in trouble and, and we're going to have inefficient code. Um, one thing I should mention is that, I mean, so this is me sort of talking from a programming language design perspective. Um, it's sort of sad that C++ always compiles this way, in some sense. Like, you always get full instantiation. You always pay sort of the long for the long compile time. And one of the areas of research that people are looking at, including myself, is sort of how can you sort of pick and choose when you want the long <coughs> compile time versus when you want, you know, fast compile time. And but are willing to let the runtime performance go slow. Like, let's say you're in, in development mode, maybe you don't care uh, about your runtime performance when you're in development mode, and, but you want fast compile times, and so you'd like to be able to flip a flag or something to say, you know, compile me fast and stuff. So that's that's something that we're looking at. So what would that look like? Do you use implicit conversions or something like that? Do I already have an instantiation that can implicitly A lot of it, so, so this may or may not be feasible in C++ as is, um, but a lot of it has to do with things like um, you know, we have this notion of like V tables for allowing sort of runtime dispatching for OO stuff. You could use things like V tables for things that we, you know, for concepts and you know, template kinds of things. So you basically turn compile time dispatching into sort of link time uh, dispatching. Mm -hmm. there, there is no potential runtime cost over templates and this is one of the things that I've heard many, many times sort of thrown at templates, which is if you're instantiating a particular template function or whatever for types which are the same size and have the same behavior, mm -hmm. you get multiple instantiations mm -hmm. even though the actual underlying generated code mm -hmm. is identical. Mm -hmm. And that then can destroy your eye cache, mm -hmm. especially if you want to type Right. Like yeah, no, that's very true. That's a very good point. Um, right, and there's there's techniques you can use from a library level or an application level to fix that, right? 
there's just sort of idioms that you can follow to deal with that. <coughs> and there are compiler techniques for doing that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, whether any of that's in practice. I don't know. Do you know of any of that? I'm trying to think. I know that, like, for example, C Sharp, the, the CLR compilers do it for, for C Sharp uh, as part of the jitting process. Um, so I, mean, I don't know what the state of the art is there. Yeah, Metro, <coughs> MetroWorks library way back when, when Howard Hennig did it, if like, it was an int or a pointer and they were the same <coughs> size and they, they don't have constructors, they were actually running the same code. Mm -hmm. you, and they did it in the library. In the library. Yeah, that's right. So it's the idioms that you just make sure to map it down to the same. <coughs> right, and you just use you know, some of these type erasure tricks to, to do that. And, and this and this kind of gets back to what I said about in most situations you can get really close performance-wise. I mean, these, you know, when you're talking about iCache misses and stuff like that, then you're starting to get into the corner case kind of situations. Um, so one of the one of the key sort of issues when you're dealing with templates and generic <coughs> programming is. Um, what types are you allowed to use when you're invoking a, a generic function? Okay, so here I'm calling the, the sort function of the standard template library uh, with a vector, and then here I'm calling it with a linked list. Right? And we end up with an error message, you know, it's, you know somewhere deep inside STL algo.h, right, the header file. <laughs> And it's saying there's no match for operator minus or subtraction, um, where you know somewhere down there they're trying to subtract last minus first. And right, so what's going on here is that you know sort wasn't meant to be used with the linked list. Perhaps, right? um, so let's so let's kind of look at that a little bit more deeply. We need to understand what these type requirements are all about. So kind of the the lingo we use nowadays is that the requirements on a template are expressed in terms of what we call concepts. From 30,000 feet, you can think of these as interfaces or abstract based classes. That's at 30,000 feet, you know, once you look closer, there are huge differences, um, but, but it's sort of the same goal here. So a concept expresses requirements, and when a particular type, like let's say a vector, satisfies the requirements of a comp concept, we say that that type models the concept. Okay. So the term models is sort of the traditional name that we've used in sort of in our programming literature. Um, nowadays, you've probably heard the term concept map used quite a bit because that's the um, that's the keyword that we came up with that didn't conflict with as much existing code. Uh, we wanted to use models, but it just conflicted with too much existing code, so we went searching for a new keyword, which was concept map. Uh, but in some sense, maybe the better sort of just from an English language standpoint, you should think to yourself, implements is probably the best sort of word to keep in your head. So you can, you can think of it as a type implementing a concept. Okay. So for the sort, you know, for the, the good old sort uh, function in the standard template library, it takes two iterators and it says, and if you go look up like on the SGI, STL website, um, you'll see these requirements on the types, and it'll say iter is a model of random access iterator. And it'll also say iter's value type is a model of less than comparable. How many people have sort of spent a fair amount of time with the SGI STL website sort of open? Okay, okay good. So almost everybody, <coughs> maybe two thirds. Uh, the other one third don't feel uh, uh, bad if you haven't looked at it or whatnot. I'm happy to sort of um, talk about that. One thing that's kind of interesting here is this thing. That, so this iter is a model of random access iterator. That, that's a kind of a type constraint that you might see in a lot of other languages. Like in Java, you'd see like you can have type parameters and you could put a bound or a constraint saying that iter like in, uh, implements random access iterator, right? But what about this one? This one's actually pretty <coughs> interesting and unique. There's, there's really only a couple languages out there in existence that have anything like this at all. Okay? And what's interesting is that what we're, we're not putting a constraint on iter itself. 
there's this relationship between iter and something called its value type. And we don't even know what that type is necessarily in this context. We just know that every iter has one. It has a, a value type. We call that an associated type. And then once we can sort of talk about this associated type, we can then put constraints on it and say that it's less than comparable, right? We're trying to sort these things. We need to be able to compare them. Yes, but, Dean. But uh, the value type is the existence of a value type in the iter mm -hmm. would have to be part of the iterator model, uh, the iterator concept. That's right. Right. In fact, it's part of this one right here, the random access iterator concept. It is. It's not directly. It's sort of like inherited up from the, you know, and we'll see the, see the way the inheritance works in a second uh, among the concepts. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And there's, in some sense, it's sort, of, it's sort of good that we put this requirement first, uh, like from a reader standpoint, because you know that, oh, this thing's a random access iterator. And if you really know what this means, then you'll then be able to read the next line and be like, okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, good thing to point out. So let's look a little bit more closely at, at this random access, random access iterator concept. This is uh, basically what it would look like in, you know, at the SGI. I've sort of pulled a chunk of the SGI documentation out. Or another good reference that's sort of equivalent is Matt Ostrom's book uh, on generic programming in the STL. It's sort of there's sort of no accident that this talk is called generic programming in the BGL, so it's kind of the same idea. Um, so what is a random access iterator? It's an iterator that provides uh, increment and decrement, just like a bidirectional iterator. And it also can move forward and backward an arbitrary number of steps in constant time. Okay? That's, that, that in constant time is crucial, right? Because um, you can, if you just had a bidirectional iterator, you could move, you could move arbitrary size steps, but it takes you linear time to do it, right? You have to run a loop that gets you from here to there, as they say in Maine. Um, I certainly have an argument with the colleague because um, um, we were discussing the tau and the q. It has a cost, uh, it has random access iterator, but it organizes that in chunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said like. Um, just imagine you have one million integers, for example, mm -hmm. and um, one page can say 1,000 one, 1, uh, integers. So um, to grab the integer, uh, um, let's say uh, 500,000 integer, mm -hmm. you have to move around 500 pages. So mm -hmm. you, you still have linear time, mm -hmm. but it is more short. Mm -hmm. it, it mostly depends on how you implement the government. Mm -hmm. But um, how, how is it? Yeah, so this is a this is a fantastic question. <coughs> and it's when you're implementing a concrete data structure, like your W and Q, you know, and you wanna you're gonna go and make claims as the implementer of that, you're gonna make these claims like this thing is an implementation of forward iterator or bidirectional iterator. And then you have to make a choice. You know, should I be claiming that this thing is a random access iterator? Uh, and you really it, this isn't so much as a choice as sort of a mathematical statement. It either is or is not. Right. So can you provide <coughs> constant time access? And you already sort of gave us the answer. The answer is no. Right. But SDL says that uh, WMQ has uh, uh, random access iterator. Then that, that may have been a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, well, on, on the other hand, from a pragmatic point of view, if by declaring yourself to be a random access iterator you get better performance than declaring yourself to be a bidirectional iterator, a lot of people are going to screw the mathematic <laughs> um, interpretation, aren't they? That's, it's, okay, so that's an interesting, I haven't quite heard it that way before. Um, <laughs> that, what, what if you just happen to get better performance when you use the algorithms? Because hap what happens internally is you're going to you're going to get different uh, dispatching to different algorithms depending on what right. you claim to be. Yeah. Right. right? Um, and so actually, I haven't seen examples of that, but if, if you in fact have some, I'd, I'd be interested to hear about that, where you, by sort of by line you get it to dispatch to the right thing. The problem is though that, so I mean maybe I should back up, so this, and back up and explain sort of like why in the first place is it generally a good idea not to lie, <laughs> okay? Um, and 
and the reason behind that is that when people, when someone's writing an algorithm, uh, and they then publish like how long the algorithm takes, they're going to say like, okay, this algorithm is like linear in the size of the number of edges and vertices, for example. Um, they're going to do that computation based on assumptions about the iterator operations, right? And if you lie about the iterator operations, then sort of the big O, you know, estimate on the overall algorithm is going to be out the door, okay? So, and I guess maybe in some sense, the other thing is that the, so that's sort of the main sort of reason why we have these, these sort of constraints is so that, so that the algorithms, when you go and look at their overall time complexity, that makes sense. The other thing that they do is the dispatching, right? And if, if the algorithm writer is making certain assumptions and he's doing computations about, okay, asymptotically, I think this is what's going to happen. Uh, if, you're, if you're constant time versus if you're not, then I want to switch to something else. So he's got a certain set of assumptions that he's working off of. And so if you sort of lie to him about that, then, then you basically have no idea what's going to happen. Unless, you, But it sounds like if you just go and test it, then maybe you know what's going to happen with that particular in, instance of the STL. But if you go use a different version, then you may get who knows yeah, what. Maybe, maybe so. I mean, the, 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 the case in point is probably one where uh, the arbitrary size steps, for instance, is order log n or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, where so you can by if you've only got a choice between random access or bidirectional, mm -hmm. um, then possibly. Yeah. But as you say, on most of the SDL, the yeah. algorithms are pretty transparent. When we get into DGL, that yeah. there may be a lot more going on. But yeah. where it's harder well, to even make in that the analysis. even in the STL, I mean, if you ever look at the sort implementations. Dave Musser's intro sort, yes. that is one sophisticated piece of software. Whew. I mean, that's a pretty amazing stuff. But yeah, I mean, a lot of them, you're right, are, are more transparent than that. So yeah. I think, Barry? I wanted to say, um, you say you make assumptions about constant time, but the concept cannot check that. That's right. And so no, that's, said, that's why it's up to... It's part, part of the concept, but um, it is. it's not it is. a checkable part. Well, it's checkable by you. <laughs> by the guy that's making the claim, right? It's, I mean, this is, this is where it all comes down to at the end of the day, right? So when you, you know, when you ship your, you know, ship your double ended Q for other people to use and you've written down stuff about it, you know, it's up to you to, for those things to be true, right? I mean, that's, you're absolutely right that we can't automatically test it. I wish we could. Uh, I've, I actually know um, over the last five, ten years, I've sort of learned a lot about they're improving and checking logical statements of these sorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's sort of a sad sort of truth about the universe, but automatically checking sort of this kind of stuff is is not just past the state of the art, but it's sort of like impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know how like the you know, you know the halting problem is undecidable, you may have heard about that issue. Uh, like if you, it's impossible to write an algorithm that decides whether a whether an arbitrary program will halt or not, in general. Um, and it's the same kind of limitations that we run into in terms of trying to check to see if you really implement a concept or not. Um, so. so, I just wanted to sort of that on the previous slide you were saying sort of the to random access operators. But actually, from a programmer's point of view, sometimes you want to be okay, sometimes you want to say, well, it's okay if I give you two bidirectional iterators because I know this list is short, right? And if you're just hacking something up, that, or even more, I think this goes even closer to the heart of the sort routine in general. You, ideally you would say sort, and you, you could get quick sort if you get bidirectional mm -hmm. iterators, and you might get merge sort if the mm -hmm. iterators come from a list. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, Potentially, there's possibility for another level of interaction. Absolutely, and that's that was that was totally, in some sense, not ruled out by what Stepanov did in the standard template library. I would think I would think that he viewed the standard template library as this sort of low level, fairly like low level interface that was meant sort of for like advanced programmers in some sense. And I mean, what you're saying is definitely 
compatible with the idea that you really want another layer on top of it, which then sort of does more dispatching and is maybe easier to use for, uh, for you know, programmers that either don't want to have to make those decisions themselves or just, you know, we're all in a rush anyway, so why not, you know, if, if it's sort of, if there's automated ways of deciding what's the right algorithm, why not just do it? Exactly. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, so. it's like, you know, in generic programming, mm -hmm. the, the book, you mm -hmm. know, where you say, I want a data structure that has these characteristics, mm -hmm. right? And you get it. Mm -hmm. It's sort of what I'm getting. Yeah, no, and I think, I mean, I would maybe say, go for it. You know, go do it. Like... You know, go build that layer on top. I mean, in some sense, I mean, like, just like with last year's keynote, Andre Alexander was like saying, oh, down with iterators, right? But really what he's saying is that we want this layer on top that's easier to use and whatnot. And I think, you know, we need them both for the algorithms and for the data structures. So I would say yes. It's meant to be built on. And I think Stepanov is actually slightly disappointed that there aren't, I mean, there's a fair number of stuff of people building stuff on top of it, but he wishes there were more. You know what I mean? Like, he wishes there were more levels and layers and, and other libraries that are like the STL. But you say build on top of it, mm -hmm. but why can't it be that interface be the abstraction? For example, um, instead of, so you relax the requirement, so you just say iter should be an iterator. And then inside sort, you well, dispatch to the correct this is, sort. Now this just gets into sort of backwards compatibility issues and cultural mm -hmm. issues. And I mean, if you want to create another namespace <coughs> called my, my easy to use STL, and then have something called sort, right. that's totally cool. Okay. Right? <laughs> it's just that this name, STD sort, is sort of, you know, for backwards compatibility reasons, you right. really can't change it. Uh, I, I, I think what it means is, uh, if you have two two kinds of inter iterators and you use the standard sort, if you you implement a new standard library and you use sort, and one uh, iterator random access dispatches to uh, this underlying sort, mm -hmm. and another yeah, no, dispatches to yeah, but it's not over, it's not on top of it. It's below it. I know, I know. Well, no, what it's doing is it's taking this lower level thing and, and modifying it by lifting it up. And that, I mean, if you could do that in a backwards compatible way, then yeah, that, might yeah. be, that might be a good way to do it. But we, I'm just saying that we have this backwards compatibility thing going on where that might, may or may not be. And so that's a whole different discussion about, mm -hmm. you know, you know, things that aren't necessarily technical choices. But that's so also I, a problem for generic code. If you do that kind of stuff, you want to dispatch the same generic code to different stuff. If you, you know, rename sort with three different names, you can't do that with generic code. To write another layer on top of sort, which is generic, and take two iterators. You have to write three versions of them, one for one dispatch, one mm -hmm. for another dispatch. This is purely a naming thing, though, because you what you're really saying is, is the same as me, put a layer on top, but then name, then change the name of the thing on top to be the same as the You, 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 you know, can't so. do this with the iterators because the iterators don't have a reference to the original container anyway, so. It's, you're right, you're right. But I was gonna point out something on the next slide, which is you were asking about this line problem with the STL, where you live at the different uh -huh. iterators, uh -huh. iterator categories. Um, there's actually a pretty interesting example of this in the boost um, iterator library, which is, you know, Dave defines a bunch of... I, I wrote that too. Sorry. I, 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 I don't remember all of the, all these names, so it might exclude him. I'm sorry. Um, you, so you define all of these uh, categories, and you actually separate the traversal from the access rate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the standard libraries as they are right now, if you define uh, a boost ra random access traversal iterator, which does not return non-reference value types. We're actually going to talk about this issue a little bit. <laughs> and I was going to say in your, in your slide actually over there, as to be a true random access iterator, that should actually say convertible to value type reference. Yeah. Or, or, uh, no. No. No, this, this is a really tricky, uh, I've dealt with so many standard, but there's, we had bugs in the standard, I, I think this is right, actually, okay. but it's, 
it's sort of been controversial. Um, but you're, you're definitely right that there are lots of situations, like just in the plain old B reference, it's going to have to be a reference return right. type. Well, you're absolutely right about that. I think these guys, that's right, but it's just a big mess, actually. So um, no, basically, <laughs> what ends up happening is, and I just want to point this out, if you guys do this, if you need a random access iterator that returns anything but a reference type using boost iterators, just say it's an STD random access iterator because several of the standard yeah, libraries I've worked with will not dispatch correctly. Yeah, um, well, th there's a big mess there, and that's why we why we sort of wanted to fix up the concepts there. So I'm wondering if we could just focus and continue on. Or was it, or yeah, yeah, let's the, let's let's, let's cut this off. To I really, I really want to see get the to, the, yeah. to the boost stuff, or the graph stuff. Yeah. All right. So, so in general, concepts can include. Uh, these are the kind of requirements that you can have in a concept. Valid expressions. These say what kind of operations you want to require. Associated types. This is where you sort of declare that an iterator has a value type or a difference type. You can use refinements. This is where the inheritance comes in. You can say, like bidirectional iterator is a forward iterator and sort of pull in all those requirements. The efficiency guarantees for the operations like plus plus is constant time, dereference is constant time. Uh, and then the semantic requirements, uh, things like pre and post conditions or invariants. Uh, and like as someone else said, some of these can be sort of checked. You know, I've, I wrote the concept check library which kind of helps you sort of instrument the code to get error messages uh, for this. Um, it's not the 100% solution. The concepts <coughs> language feature would have given us a uh, much better solution. Um, but then there's these things down here that you just have to sort of check yourself and make sure that you're, you're being uh, truthful about that. Um, OK, so, so just looking at this, this example again, we can now sort of make more sense of this. We have a vector. It has an iterator associate type, which indeed is a model of random access iterator, so it's perfectly okay to use sort here. Down here, <coughs> where we're trying to use a list, that's wrong. The list iterator is not a model of random access iterator, and indeed you do get an error message. It would be nice if the compiler gave us an error message that says, hey, you're not a random access iterator. That's what the concept proposal would have done. So, question? I have a remark to the, to the last slide. Uh -huh. um, you're saying you have to, to check the semantical requirements yourself. Mm -hmm. But this is really the hard stuff, and I think this this is the, the core of the um, of the properties and characteristics of the concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm going to give a talk that is saying you can check it. You cannot prove it, but you can check it. Ah, by on, testing. By testing. <coughs> Absolutely. You, you can support automatic testing mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, that's, that's <coughs> great stuff. It's not a proof, mm -hmm. but you can do it very smart so that you can be very confident that, that there yeah, is and a, I would, a little... I would totally that. encourage people to use that yeah. stuff and, you know, to its full extent. And I, I believe very highly in testing in terms of trying to make sure that you're satisfying these kind of things. And you want to, even if you were going to go and do the proof yourself, you'd still want to start with testing. Because it's a lot easier to find bugs in by doing tests than by doing proofs. Uh, so the testing. best way would be to, to prove it with a, with a theorem checker. But yep. uh, for a language like C++, this is immensely complex. Yep. yep. So nobody came up with a, with a tool. Right. Yeah. It's it's well beyond the state of the art right now. I've been trying to I've been tracking the state of the art pretty carefully, and it's we're we're there's some hope actually, just recently, uh, some some results, but we have a long way to go. So, but moving forward, um, this is what the uh, iterator hierarchy looks like, you know, in sort of the current standard C plus um, plus, as pointed out by Tom. Tom. Tom this, and, and in a lot of papers that I've written, this isn't the ideal breakdown and it's got problems. Um, but maybe this is the point of like, to ask the question, where do concepts come from? <coughs> when do you create, when does someone decide to create a new concept and why? Like what's the appropriate time? Like does someone just sort of sit there in their room and just sort of concepts pop up? Um, 
you know, where do, where do they come from? Uh, does anyone know where they come from? <laughs> What's that? From outer space. Outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Alex um, Stepanov. It's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the one tangible product of SETI. <laughs> SETI, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, in my experience, they, they come from the experience that you discover in real world programming the same problem <coughs> more than once, and then you begin thinking what is the common. Uh, the common ground of this. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be very specific, so you're, you're out there programming, you're programming algorithms, okay? So the concepts come from algorithms, okay? It's not the other way around. And I, it's, I emphasize this because in object-oriented programming, I think there was a, a really strong push that you sort of design this beautiful hierarchy, right. and then you go and write code. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's not the right way to do it. Okay. This hierarchy did not pop out of nowhere from outer space. No, what happened was Stepanov was writing hundreds of algorithms and variations on algorithms, and he was looking for commonality. And these, it's more, think of yourself more of a biologist okay, than a, a computer scientist. He found these things by looking at algorithms. Okay? And so if you're implementing new algorithms, don't be surprised if concepts pop up. And don't don't feel bashful about creating concepts. Okay, if you're building new algorithms. Okay, um, so that's that's where they come from. The whole the whole point of an algorithm is to help you describe the minimal requirements that a particular algorithm needs. Okay, and I would furthermore say that an, a concept deserves to exist if there's one algorithm that needs it. Okay. Was that? Because I was going to ask the question: How many do you need? Do you, you just need start? one. One generic algorithm that needs a concept, and boom, there it is. I mean, in some sense, concepts themselves are, aren't actually necessary. You could go totally a la carte, and you could say, for this algorithm, I just have this giant laundry list of requirements. It, but we don't do that, because it just turns out that a lot of algorithms happen to have the same requirements over and over again, and we put names on those things. right? Um, but that also explains why there's this sort of fine-grained slicing. Okay. You know, why don't we just have this one iterator thing called the, the be-all, end-all, random access iterator, right? Well, because this guy would be the wrong requirement for an awful lot of algorithms. It would be right. too restrictive, and it would limit the reusability of an algorithm. Okay. So like, let's say you said your find function had to, be random, had to have a random access iterator. All of a sudden, now find doesn't work with, or it's not supposed to work now with lists, even though it really should. Right. So that's, that's where they come from. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in some sense I already answered this. Is it better to use few, few or many requirements in a template? The answer is few. The few, the fewest possible that you can get away with, and still get the algorithm to work. That's an important process of trying to reduce and minimize uh, the requirements. Uh, I mean, when is it time to define a new concept? When you're implementing new algorithms, and, and there just doesn't happen to be a concept out there already that matches the minimal minimal requirements. That you any, any other questions about that? This is, I don't know if you've, this is old hat for some of you, but I, I don't think it's published in that many places, so it's, I think it's important to kind of stress, you know, where these things come from and when to, when to create new ones. Okay. You can actually get into problems if you, if you try to take a, let's say you sort of just grab one of the existing guys, even though it's not a good fit, you can actually sort of screw up your algorithm a little bit because it might not be the minimal thing you need. So would, would concepts apply also in when you're building structural, uh, when you're actually designing... Data structures? Yeah, not or? really data structures, more like uh, interaction between modules. So if you're, if you're working at the higher level, mm -hmm. for example, if you're actually making a web service, mm -hmm. Would concepts in this, in this sense apply? Yeah, it would apply in the sense that you have algorithms in your web services or something. And if you have algorithms that kind of end up showing up in different disguises in multiple places and you want to somehow create a generic algorithm that sort of spans all of those, mm -hmm. then that's where a concept would pop up. Okay. Well, but it would it'd be based on the code. You have to, it's right. always, you're staring at code, you're seeing commonality, and you want to you want to you know pull that commonality commonality out. I think actually this was for I was going to say that you also have um, 
sem semantic correctness with, with your invariance and pre and post conditions that you for a web surface, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can, it can oftentimes help you express your invariance by organizing it this way. My experience is uh, it is um, sometimes better to recognize that a concept is already there or is identical to, to a concept that is, that is already there than to, be, than to uh, come up with a new concept. For example, uh, I did this library of interval containers mm -hmm. and I thought this is some new thing, mm -hmm. but the point where I saw that um, such a container is just a set, it has all the properties of a simple set of elements, mm -hmm. although it's differently implemented. Mm -hmm. This was a great breakthrough and made everything more simple. Mm -hmm. Or if you have, I don't know, in networking some uh, uh, some grids and you discover it can be done with graphs, mm -hmm. um, I think this step is, is much more important than, than coming up with new, new, new concepts. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so I think what you're saying is, is compatible with, uh, with what I'm saying, but just um, in some sense maybe I skipped over what, you were, what you're saying now, was that in some sense, you know, if there's something that does match what you want, and maybe finding a match takes a little bit of, or a lot of thought, that's great. Uh, and you certainly want to stick with, you know, you don't want to just come up with new interfaces for no reason. I mean, especially because when you do that, you're sort of forcing other data structure implementers to do a lot of work. Right? So if you if there's something that fits that's already there, my God, you know, use that. Don't don't you know make the rest of us miserable dealing with your own idiosyncrasies. <laughs> okay? But but on so but on the other side of the coin though, if you really do have some fundamental different thing <laughs> and you've tried hard to look at the existing things and it's just not there, then at that point, you know, feel okay to go ahead and create a new a new concept. So is there one place? Mm -hmm. We've said several times now, if there's a concept already there, where's there? Where's there? It's spread out. So it's yeah. you know the standard library, <coughs> boost libraries, um, you know, that's the main places, uh, but there are other libraries out there as well. Uh, you know, I guess in some sense it would be nice if we had a more centralized thing just for the concept aspect of it. Uh, that'd be plus, nice. plus concept publishing repository of some sort. Right, because these things really are, they're like standards. Okay, these are things that lots of people have to agree on. Because they're, this is the communication mechanism between the data structures and the, the algorithms. Right. And so these are things that really a lot of people have to agree on. So I generally start with the assumption I'm not doing anything that somebody else hasn't already thought about. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather find something that somebody else thought about. And I, I say that that's usually true. That it's not always easy to do. Yeah. And what happens is two years down the road you find out, oh, mm -hmm. well, there's a much better implementation and mine isn't really what I should have. Right. I to be part of this spoiled the cool. You really want to get to the graph stuff. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> two thirds of the way through it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're two thirds of the way through. Yeah. Okay. Uh, associate types. How many people know about traits? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Skip that. <laughs> okay, so this is the end of the generic programming recap. Uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, dive into yeah. the graphs at this point. All right, and maybe we can go a little bit late too, since we had the whole switch over and stuff. Yeah. We have like a two-hour lunch break, so maybe going a little late would be fine. All right, so graphs. Right, this is uh, an abstract. It's a mathematical abstraction that we use to solve certain kinds of problems. Um, examples <coughs> include internet packet routing, telephone network design. You know, AT and T put a huge amount of a lot of the fundamental graph theory comes from AT and T labs or Bell Labs. You know, Molecular biology, building software systems. So we basically what we have here in a graph is you've got vertices, or <coughs> also called nodes, and then edges. Right, so here's a simple graph that's describing how long it takes to drive from one city to the next in Colorado. <laughs> or not necessarily city, Mary Jane is just my favorite place to ski. Okay. So the, and then you don't necessarily have to have things on the edges or, or uh, labels, but here I'm labeling the edges with the, the time. 
and just some of the ways that we can store and represent graphs that are out there. There's edge list data structure, or this is sort of a typical edge list where you have each of these pairs describes an edge that source and target vertex, um, and they're just you know just all the edges are listed there. Okay. Um, here's another style of representation: a jacency list for every vertex. We list the numbers <coughs> in the graph. Okay. And then last but not least, we've got an adjacency matrix structure here, where you basically have like a Boolean, like yes or no. <coughs> the check marks here are yes. There's an edge between like Boulder and Bale, means there's a road directly between those two. Okay. Uh, these are sort of the most classical representations. Out in the wild, we see even more representations, very application-specific structures where you just have point, random pointers sort of uh, that, that you can think, of, think about as being a graph structure. And then we have lots of graph algorithms. Um, it's, it's actually amazing how many different things out there you can think of as graph algorithms. And um, I have a feeling that a lot of people accidentally re-implement graph algorithms all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the BGL probably could get used a lot more if people just realize that what they're working on happens to be a graph algorithm. But that's sort of this, it takes a little bit of mathematical training to realize when a particular abstraction, uh, to recognize that it's useful in a particular place. Uh, so here's one problem. How do you find your way out of a maze? Um, by the way, who knows, who knows the difference between a maze and a labyrinth? There's a way out. Uh, islands. There's a way out. That's almost right. A, a labyrinth, there's always there's only one path. So it's always really easy to find your way to the middle of the labyrinth because there's really only one path. Uh, whereas a maze, a maze is actually tricky. There's dead ends, you know, it's you know, it may take you a long time to find the right path to the to the end. Okay, so how do you how do you find your way out of a maze? Well, if you're familiar with graph algorithms, you can just say, hey, that's, that's just depth first search. Okay? Or, in fact, you could use any exhaustive search to get yourself out of a maze. Okay? And so with depth first search, this is the trick where you mark where you've been, and then if you hit a dead end, you backtrack to some, some hallway or whatever where, you, where there's a, an outgoing <coughs> sort of way that you haven't marked yet. And of course, you know, then you've got all these wonderful stories about like leaving breadcrumbs, but then someone coming behind and eating the breadcrumbs, and you're in trouble. So here's like the pseudocode for <clears throat> your typical depth first search. So you've got a graph G, and you've got some vertex U, which is your starting point. And then you mark you mark that vertex. I'm going to mark it black. It's like check mark to say I've been there. Okay. And then you look at all your adjacent, all your neighbors, so all the paths from your current spot, and you check to see if it's white. That means has it not been visited yet. And if it is white, then you go ahead and recursively go and search down that, that direction. If you come back from that having found what you were looking for, then you can say, oh, good, I found what I'm looking for, and, and keep uh, retreating back. Uh, if you haven't, then you just go to the next you know, iteration of this loop, try the next uh, path out that still hasn't been uh, visited. Okay, so I want to sort of turn this into a little bit of a design sort of experiment of, you know, let's say you're, you're, you've, you've found some pseudocode in a math textbook somewhere uh, or a computer science textbook that sort of solves the problem you need. How do you turn that into a C++ implementation of a, of a generic, uh, you know, generic function. Uh, and the first, the real question there, almost the only question is, what should the type requirements look like for this kind of, uh, for this kind of algorithm? Now what, or another way to say is, what capabilities do we need from our inputs to get the job done? Okay, so maybe let's just start sort of brainstorming here. What do you guys think are necessary requirements? We'll start with the, the very first line of the code there. You need to be able to recognize when you're at the exit. Yep. yep. Or at an exit in the case right. of 
of multiple exits. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And can you think of like what would, what might be a way of, you know, representing that in terms of C plus plus? It must satisfy some sort of predicate. Right. And would you, so right? Would you have that predicate written out right here, or no, that would be one of my type parameters? In, 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 that that would be one of your inputs. So you yes. input a predicate. So right. Exactly. Yep. And, right. the predi and the predicate has its own set of requirements. It says given a graph. Right. Returns true or false. If or, or given a vertex. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It, it needs the graph. <coughs> I think it would need the graph as well. Possibly. Possibly. Sure. Yeah. And you need to efficiently mark the vertices. Right. So how do we do this? <coughs> now, this pseudocode is sort of suggestively sort of used brackets, which might make us think about arrays. But would it be okay to just say, okay, fine, we're just going to internally use an array? Does that make sense? What do you guys think? Should we use an array? Thomas is saying no. Anyone else have an opinion? You have no idea how big the graph is, so that doesn't sound like a good idea. Okay, so you're worried about space consumption? Well, um, well, well I think yeah. that uh, how the the you're going well. to look into the arrays then. Uh, how do you look? You need to translate uh, the vertex to the index of the array. Right, right. So how do, so there's, mm -hmm. how do you go from a, a vertex to an integer offset, right, which is, would be how you'd access an array. <coughs> you know, there are a lot of graph representations where you do have integers sitting around for every vertex, but there also are plenty of other graph representations where you don't have integers. For example, consider sort of your typical uh, graph as giant pointer structure in memory, right? There aren't any integers sitting around for every node, so this would not, this would not work for that. Hey, Dean? Oh. I would make mark an actual operation mm -hmm. instead of uh, so I can make it a little a little more permissive. Mm -hmm. I just say okay, mark you mm -hmm. the, the vertex as being black mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah. So how how mark is implemented would be hidden. Hidden. That's right. That's a great idea. And we just we have to just flesh that out a little bit more. So we need to be able to write. We need to be able to associate black with you, and then later on we need to be able to read it back out. Right? This is a read operation here, and compare it to white. Okay, and that's basically it. We need to be able to read and write to this thing. Okay, and that's it. So what thing? Because you're not necessarily going to read and write to you. You just need to associate. You need an association. This is actually a relationship. You want to have a relationship between you and the color. And, and this coloring, black or white. Right, so we need some way of, of talking about relationships. Okay. Or some generic purpose. That's right. That's, we're gonna, after we do this brainstorming session, we'll show sort of what, what I came up with mm -hmm. for all of this. Right, so we need to be able to ask for what are the adjacent vertices. And then that in itself right. presents a problem of how do you return those. Sure. Yeah, how do you, you know, like you could be naive about it. In fact, there's like old versions of like Leda. Uh, they're my competitor. <laughs> old, but their new versions are better. But the old version, like, you return like a list by value out of this thing. It's just mind boggling and bad um, for performance reasons. But yeah, you want to be smart about how you do that. I think that might be it. Um, Don't let uh, give mark. Back in that recursive DFS code, because we lose it now. I'm sorry, what was that? The mark uh, array or map or how do you call it has to be returned in that recursive code DFS. Yes, yes. The pseudo this is pseudocode and it's sort of not necessarily. Uh, okay. But but maybe yeah. mark really should have been a parameter here. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Yes, yeah. absolutely right. And this is where like. A lot of times, of you're looking at pseudocode and some textbook, and it may, you know, assume things. Some things are global, and yeah. oftentimes when you're dealing with libraries, global is like <laughs> you never want to do that, right? Okay. So what we've just come up with are, are all of these requirements here, right? These are all these needs that the uh, that the algorithm has. Okay. Uh, so. So what I, what I did when I was coming up with the boost graph library is I basically just sort of looked at those needs and then, and then invented concepts to match each one. So this, 
This is the adjacency graph concept. And what it does is it says it provides a, a function, or this is the valid expression for this uh, concept, where you can ask for the adjacent vertices of a particular vertex in a, in a particular graph. Okay? And what you get back is a pair of, of this thing called an adjacency iterator. And in the adjacency iterator, you can, it's a first last pair. So you can iterate through that, that range to get all the adjacent vertices. Um, furthermore, there's some associated types. If you've got an adjacency graph, you can ask, what is the vertex descriptor? The term descriptor is a little bit funny, but all this is is a handle for a vertex. Now that handle, the type of that handle could actually depend on the graph that you're dealing with. It might be an integer, it might be a pointer, who knows what. The algorithm doesn't care what it is as long as it sort of plays the right role. Okay, question? So why return a, why specify that it returns a pair of adjacency iterators and not specify that it returns a range? A pair is a range. Yeah, yeah. but a range might not be a pair. But a, this a pair sort of does enough. Uh, well, you, you actually, what do you mean by a range? Actually, and this proceeds precedes range by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this does precede range, but uh, and but thankfully, when they built range, they made sure that pairs of iterators would be ranges. But so. you might want to have your own graph structure that would have something else that is not a pair and return that immediately. Instead um. Of a pair of yes, ranges. but it's actually. The choice of pair is sort of minimally intrusive. That you could go ahead and wrap your your. Let's say you have your own graph data structure. I, I mean, in the in the in the um, in the pseudo code you wrote, the last part is basically has to be defined with the where you're searching for a node in the adjacent mm -hmm. adjacent vertices mm -hmm. that hasn't that hasn't yet been marked and that mm -hmm. satisfies the. The okay, well, that's not quite right, but but I mean, getting back to your question about like, let's say you have some new graph class, like, would it be sort of onerous to implement this? The answer is no. I mean, if you have a range, any kind of range object, then it's trivial to create a pair of iterators. Right? So this is this really is sort of a minimalistic requirement on, on things, and and thankfully, like once you know range algorithms and these kind of things come along, this stuff just works. Right? So. But by saying that, aren't you advocating that every sort of concept specification should be replaced by something that is minimally obtrusive and can satisfy yes. that concept? Yes. But then why would you use a concept at all? Because the out so this is this trade-off between what the algorithm needs and what data structures can provide. And so that's why the algorithm writer always wants to minimize his requirements, but it can only go so far. Like I have to somehow have a way of accessing or asking for the adjacent vertices. You have right. to be able to iterate them, but do you have to know that, do you have to get the, a pair of iterators? So this, there, there's only, what I would say is that there's, there's only a syntactic <coughs> difference between this and, and any other thing that you'd care about. And so a, these syntactic differences are very easy to sort of, glo to sort of gloss over. And, and fix, okay? What's important is there are no semantic sort of requirements here that sort of are, that some data structure is incapable of, of like adding glue code and making it work. And so this, this sort of from the, you know, maybe I should say yes, like if I were gonna do this over again, and now that there's the range interfaces, that would be a way of loosening the specification up a little bit, and that'd be a, a, that'd be a small improvement, so. I think that's probably the easiest thing to say about that. Okay. But, hey, yeah, sorry. Uh, just to follow that discussion, mm -hmm. for example, I was working on a graph that I didn't know the extent of mm -hmm. in the beginning. Sure. So, then how would I do this if it was a pair of iterators when I don't know the it's, extent? It's not the. Well, here you just need. This just says that if you're at a particular, <coughs> if you're at one vertex here, you need to know who you're connected to, and that's it. Okay. That's all it's saying. That's all. This, this is just the, the neighboring guys. 
And right, if so we don't if you don't know the neighboring guys, then you really can't run this this algorithm. <laughs> so then, why can't I just give you a handle to something that you can iterate? That's what That's this is. That's what this is. You you would have to accept the iterator itself. So this adjacency iterator, I should maybe I should take a step back here. This is not a class. This adjacency iterator here, it's an associated type, right. which means that for any particular graph implementation. You get to pick whatever you want. Okay. So, All right. So there's a game here. So then you I get to, to make, pick. Yeah. So I then have to make it an iterator first. So that. Well, you need to when you when you, you implement your JSON iterator for your class, you need to provide. Um, the concept. Of the it must model multi-pass input iterator. All right. Okay. Okay. So you got to do that, or else the code won't work. Right. Okay. Because you need to, so that means you need to provide like dereference and plus plus and and like i equal to j. Right? You did a, those are the main ones. Now, actually, here's an interesting question: Why? So this multi-pass input iterator, you probably haven't heard of that, right? So, and we're, I'll tell you a little bit about that. That let's call it MP iterator. It comes in between forward. <coughs> And input. Okay. And the reason why it exists is because two things. There's requirements in here in forward iterator that aren't needed by a lot of these graph algorithms. Okay. In in particular, requiring that when you do a dereference, that you get a you get an actual L value reference back. That's not really a requirement of a lot of these algorithms. The other side of that is that there's some graph data structures where you can't give back an L value. Okay. So for example, um, at later a little bit later on, I'll talk about a nice tour uh, graph where the graph doesn't really exist. Yeah. Okay, and if it doesn't exist, you can't give an L value to it. Okay, so so there's really there's specific examples that say why we need this this guy in between, and this is part of the motivation for why we came up with new um, new iterator concept hierarchy. All right. So can you say that the adjacency uh, iterator is a concept that inherits from multi-pass iterator concept? No, no. So Adjacent, so what, these are associated types, right? So anything that wants to model adjacency graph has to provide an adjacency iterator. Okay? And you do that using by type depths and traits and stuff like that. But you have to go and implement some guy. But and, and then that, that adjacency iterator has to implement multi-pass input iterator. Well, fundamentally, from your requirement standpoint, they're all concepts. Because they're just a bunch of requirements from whatever the adjacent to the iterator type depth is. It has to support, you know. Well, I wouldn't say that adjacency iterator is a concept. Okay, I would say that it's an associated type that is part of the requirement of this concept. And then we then put other requirements on that associated type, which are expressed by another concept. So it's certainly associated types are part of what makes up a concept. And you can use concepts to constrain them. But I wouldn't say that an associated type is a concept. Uh, it's always just part of part So of if you have a vertex and then you take your adjacency iterator, uh, how far does it go? This 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 to its adjacent one or can you go further so down the Just the, the adjacent one. one. Just the adjacent. You can't go down the You have to one, once you get an adjacent guy, you can then <laughs> take this vertex and say, What are your adjacent? What are, you can get an adjacency iterator for this guy. Oh, you have to keep this iterator. <clears throat> yeah, and that's actually what happens in, in the code here. That's why it was in the Yeah, that's why it's recursive. So if we go back to the pseudocode, we get this V is sort of the result of, of dereferencing the adjacency iterator, and then you then do a recursive call, which then asks for its adjacency. So, all right. Okay, how about marking? This is where the property map concepts come into play. Um, and these, this is a really simple uh, set of concepts. We have one that lets you do reading. So you can say get with a property <coughs> map and a key that gives you back a reference to the value underneath. 
and then uh, put, where you can give it a key value pair and it will associate the key and value together. I was always wondering what was the complexity of support because it's nowhere stable to boost down. Ah, my bad. <laughs> uh, it's, it's supposed to be <laughs> constant time or amortized. Con Usually when people, when we say constant time, we mean amortized constant time. Now, uh, we often use red black trees, for example, in here, and so then you're getting logarithmic time. Um, so, you, you, you just reinforced the thing we started at the beginning of the. Uh, Sometimes we lie. We lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, maybe more commonly you'll see, you know, at least maybe one of the, the way to say it is if you're lying, know that you're lying and know that what sort of what what uh, guarantees are no longer hold. Yeah. So, so or right. just why don't we just give a number bound? And say that's what the, that's what the time can, that's yeah. what those guarantees yeah. are. They are upper bounds, that is okay. and so the upper bounds are no longer valid. All right. So when you say you just make it, you know, at most exponential. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but you, you can't do that. Helpful. Like yeah. let's say get is not. Exp let's say this you call get and then it's you know not exponential time. You know it's bigger somehow. You know. Let's let's not get. Into no. the weeds here. Yeah. <laughs> we, could, we could discuss this further. I have a very quick question. Is reference in that case with an associated type, or is it an actual T reference? Convertible. No, no, is that. So is it's, it? a, it's an associated type. Oh, oh, oh. oh it's an associated sorry. type right here. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't and it's, yeah, I was going fast, but, no, but it is. Yeah, so this is pretty darn loose right here. It's meant to be that way. Um, And then we need a way to carry out custom actions during the search, like checking for success and terminating and things like that. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip over this part. Uh, what I'm kind of skipping over is that um, just this white black marking is sort of coarse and you can actually sort of, there's a lot of information you might miss out on if you wanna do white and black marking. For example, you might wanna catch that there's a cycle, like this guy has a cycle back going to here. And it'd be nice, nice to realize when you have cycles, let's say you're trying to build like a make file tool or something, you want to see if there's cycles in your file dependencies or something. And if you add a, a gray color to your color scheme, then you can, and if, you, if you're going along and you see something that's gray, then you can tell that, oh, now I've got a cycle. Um, and you can't really see it. These are, these are gray here, this guy's black. This, blue edge here is saying, oh, I'm mono a black guy, and I'm looking and I see a gray guy. That means he's a, just, he was one of my ancestors in the tree, and so I've got a back edge. Um, so once we have this new color scheme, we can sort of put in a whole bunch of generic callbacks into the depth first search algorithm. When you first initialize a vertex, when you discover a vertex for this first time, when you're looking at an edge, when you've figured out, oh, this is a tree edge, this is an edge that I'd actually traverse to you know, find where I need to go. Um, a back edge, right, this is where you've got a cycle, or where you've got a forward or cross edge. Um, and so, what the idea here with this DFS visitor is it's this, it's this basically, it's a lot like, you know, you're used to a lot of STL functions where you, you pass in a functor as sort of like a callback. This is like a whole bunch of callbacks sort of glommed together and you pass them in as one big class that has that sort of, you know, and, and I've done a little bit of work to make this easy where, you know, there's sort of like a default guy that doesn't do anything and you just override the ones that you want to, mm -hmm. that you actually want to implement. Uh, and so that makes it sort of easy to sort of plug in which callbacks you want. Are visitors allowed to modify the arguments? Uh, no. In general, no. Um, you so could just more like do Yeah. So if you were to start modifying the vertex or the graph, like if you were to start like changing the graph structure, then the iteration would very easily get screwed up. Like marking, for instance. No, no. The marking that's not that's not changing the graph structure, and that's going through the the property map interface. And so yeah. If, 
yeah, you're definitely going to be changing marks and stuff like that. Or, or you might even have other property maps that you want to keep track of in your visitor. Like that's how we implement the shortest paths. And the property map, is it directly associated with the graph uh, instance? Or uh, is it kept separately? This, it's just, it's set, it well, yes and no. Yeah. It's okay. Me. So that's the, in some sense, that's sort of the wrong question. Uh, be, and it's, <coughs> it's a natural question to ask, but because of the generic programming style here, what we've done is we've said that you pass something called a, something that implements the property map interface into the algorithm. Okay? Now, this interface is so generic that it might ha so happen that the, that the actual data is sitting on a struct with the node. Okay? And you could implement this get and put could just be like doing field member, you know, data member access. Or it could be that you've got this hash table off to the side. And this get and put are going into that hash table and accessing it. So because of this highly generic interface, you know, you can deal with whatever whatever you throw at it can handle, no problem. So I was just curious because that addresses the question. If it's separate then uh, you know the visitor is not modifying the actual graph in a sense. But uh, because if you have two visitors you know doing their job then they're gonna Right. So the key thing, thing is that you're not you're not changing the but, graph structure, so the adjacency case, structure. At this level, you don't care if it's uh, right. Okay. Uh, one more concept. Um, one thing you'll notice that when we started talking about this DFS visitor, we started talking about edges, not just vertices. And so now, instead of just talking, like let's say this is our current vertex here. Instead of just saying who's adjacent to me, you also want to talk about the edges. So what this concept here, on the next slide, this incidence graph concept, this gives you access to the edges that are what's called incident to the current vertex. Okay? So you can ask for the out edges, you can ask for the source and the target. Now there's a couple other concepts that I won't show you, but there's ones that allow you to access the in edges um, and also there's versions that are undirected um, but for depth for search this is what we need is just be able to access the out edges and then once you have an edge I notice that I haven't hard coded what an edge has to be there's just this associated type edge descriptor and if you're implementing a graph you need to provide some type that that provides a source and target function and sort of is the thing that you get when you dereference an out edge iterator. So this is what <coughs> the depth first visit function looks like in the boost graph library. You know, now the graph is, a, is parameterized and it's, it needs to be a model of instance graph. You need to pass in where you're starting your, your search and that thing has to be of the, of the vertex descriptor for that graph. And of course, we use trace to, to map that across. And then you have to pass in a property map and then a visitor uh, to tell it what you want to do uh, during the search. When you say it's, it's looking like this in the graph library, it's looking like this, or it's looking with a small line with a boost concept checked between the first two? Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, so I've. You know, here I put the semicolon. This is just the no between template and <coughs> oh oh you mean here yes well <coughs> I mean you mean like once we have concepts in the language someday because the you mean you wrote the concept library right oh you mean the concept checking library yeah so yeah concept checks are in here the the library version is in is already in here yeah and the, depending like I when I put them in they were it was a bunch of like in the first few lines of the implementations where those show up uh, the, I. Uh, there may be a newer version that uses macros to put them up here instead. Um, but I don't have any, any um, zero, no, no OX uh, for this. I was wondering how you implement it. Yeah, I mean, it would take another whole talk to tell you how I implemented the concept checking library. No, no, not the, not the concept check. If you implement it or if you waited for the OX to come. Well, no, so I, I implemented I, 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 I created the concept checking library and then used it on this library, okay. used it here, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that was a lot of the motivation. Like after having created the concept tracking library and using it on the boost graph library, you know, I was like, oh, this is frustrating. Like it doesn't quite get the job done. And that sort of motivated the work on the, on the language feature. So. So here's, here's a, um, let's think about applications, right? How do you, you, so I've shown you all this generic stuff. You know, now, what if we're actually trying to solve a particular problem? What if we want to find, we want to find a path that gets us out of the maze, right? And by a path, I mean, you know, a list of some kind of something that can, we can sort of recover you know, the list of edges, list of vertices, something that sort of tells us, you know, because the depth for search will actually explore the entire graph. Yeah. But how do we get the, the path to the way out? And how, how would we use, you know, you know, just making a call to this function here to get that job done? Do you want any path or the shortest path? Well, let's just say that there was, a, that there was something here that was the exit. So, I mean, if you want to do some post-processing, that's fine too, but, but the key thing is that you will, you know, there was some exit somewhere and you want to keep that path. I think we should know a little bit more about visitors, if visitor is able to interrupt uh, uh, visitation. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, Maybe I'll say a little bit more about this visitor. So it's, in some sense, all of, uh, by interrupt you mean stop the, stop the algorithm. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, we've sort of gone back and forth on that. Um, <coughs> the kind of a answer to that that I've sort of historically <coughs> pushed is that there's this feature called exceptions yeah. that's been talked about <laughs> in the other <laughs> world. Yeah. And <laughs> those are a great way to to sure, yeah, yeah. every C plus book states you shouldn't use exception just to signal some um, behavior where you um, yeah. let's say um, should let's take uh, that discussion not somewhere error. else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good one for lunch. So yeah. I would I would suggest <laughs> so my answer to that is so it's good that lots of people say a certain thing. What are the reasons for them saying that, and do those reasons apply to this? And and think sort of independently for yourself as to, and and also think about the performance implications. Think about it all, and and check whether because any global like so like you're sort of talking about this global statement, right? And whenever there's a global statement, you know, when it actually comes down to it, on any given instance, it may or may not be true. And so you want to sort of think about the rationale for the global statement and why would it be true or not true in this given instance. Actually, I would, I would expect here some, some kind of an interface like find if in STL. Mm -hmm. Because yep. uh, I could pass a predicate. That's, the other, say, yep, that's um, the other obvious alternative for how to do it. And so, yeah, so let's take this offline, but uh, there's good reasons for the exception-based approach. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And that it's not as cut and dry as it might seem. So. I would even go so far to argue that it's better. Okay. So, but, but that's a whole other whole other topic. Okay, so how do we how do we how do we solve this problem? How do we keep track? Of it? <coughs> so, so, if you relax the requirement on the return of the adjacent vertices, and you can return anything that is a range there, you have something on the stack that you control on the side. On, on your no, side. No, 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 you're cheating. Exactly. You're not allowed to change you're not allowed to change anything. So so my final question is you you're you're stuck with this. Uh, okay. You're stuck with this. Uh, okay. You're stuck with this. You know, you're stuck with you know you can you can still fiddle with the agency iterator and put something there that will be okay, that's here. I I Fiddling with the adjacency iterator is allowed because you you're the one that's providing the you're passing the graph in, yep. but I would say that that's definitely not the most straightforward way to do it. So just looking at your function signature, are you assuming that the visitor is a stateless? Object? No, no. The no. Visitor, I mean, it's got to be a stateful visitor, okay. isn't it? Um, yeah. In some sense, there's got to be some state somewhere. You want to record. You want to record these paths. <clears throat> 
right? So there's got to be some state. It's copied by failure. Yeah. yeah, so you have a... Yeah, so you, so you lose your... Yeah, you so. lose the changes. No, you could no. Pass this, uh, so you pass a pointer. Yeah. So your visitor has a pointer to an array. Um, okay. So <laughs> your visitor keeps it static. Yeah. Your things, when the predicate is satisfied, when you do visit mm -hmm. it, um, discover vertex one. Sure. Your predicate is true on that, you throw an exception on that. Right. So, right. So that's a very that's a great way to do it. You have a stack when you um, <coughs> let's see what you can do. When you uh, when you go over a tree edge, you could sort of push the target on. Um, uh, the, when you return failure you pop it off. Yeah when you return failure you pop it off. Um, yeah. That's that's basically what you need to do. The, uh, well, I don't think, I think there's a missing yeah. event here of finish yeah. vertex, yeah. 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 Which, yeah. which should be up here, like, yeah. I'm positive it's in the actual <laughs> library, and so <laughs> finish vertex would be where you'd do the popping and also where you'd be looking at whether you're at the exit or not. Okay. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> so finish, yeah. Because it's definitely in the library. Yeah. Right, so that's one way to do it. Another. I mean, and, um, another way to do it is not, you could, the, the stack is probably the best way because it's the most space efficient, but you could just, for the entire depth first tree that's formed by the whole search, you could record, for every tree edge, you could re record that edge, usually by like maybe saying, what's the parent of this guy, so you can work your way backwards. That would be a pretty common way to do it. Uh, and then when you finally exit, find your exit, you then could just say, Oh, traverse backwards using these parent pointers uh, to yeah. reconstruct the path. Yeah, the that's easier. not always possible if you have multiple paths. Some have, some no, it is, will, no, it is possible. Multiple parents. No, no, because this what comes out of the depth first search is a tree. Yeah. These tree edges. Now, by definition, a tree only has one parent per node. Yeah. Which is fine. So you always you always can. <coughs> oh, you build a tree. Okay. Yeah. What I'm saying is you use these yeah. parent pointers to, re to yeah, always remember, yeah, so when you hit a tree edge, you say, oh, target vertex, his parent is the source vertex. We're done. Uh, right, so to deal with graphs that aren't connected, what you typically do is, you don't use depth first visit, there's this other function that goes on top of it called depth first search, which restarts the search. Uh, by looking through the entire list of vertices, trying to find one that it never got to because it wasn't connected, and restarts the search from there. So, so you have a tough time getting out of the remains which are not connected. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that. Yeah. So <laughs> for the maze example, this is sort of <laughs> a new, not a new maze. point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just, just, just so you know, we are at the end of the tape. Okay. Well, I think probably the thing to do is just. As long as you guys want to keep going, I'm, I could go till like one uh, if you guys are interested. Okay, cool. We got. Uh, yeah, we'll just. Oh well, we just won't have the whole thing. Right. It's got like two minutes left. Yeah. Yes, we we get slides after. Yeah. Yeah. So then we can proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So here's the actual implementation of depth first visit. A little snazzed up. This isn't the way it looks like in the <laughs> header file. Like. I had to put in the new for loop and stuff. Uh, so, so what's going on here? You know, you're you're marking <coughs> that a vertex is gray, calling that discover vertex event point. Then we're iterating over the out edges. We've got our target vertex v, checking that the whether the color's white or not. Um, you know, here like this puts some constraints on the property map and the value, sort of the values that are in the property map. So they really have to be these things that, you know, can be compared to, I think it's this enumerated thing of white, black, or gray. Um, now here we've got, you're sort of saying, hey, we found a tree edge, and then we're going to go and visit down into the, recursively visit the rest of the graph down in that, that part of the, the uh, graph. We could, after coming back, or another alternative if it's already gray, <coughs> and we've found the back edge. Otherwise, it's a forward or cross edge. And then once we're out of this loop, then here is uh, marking it as black, and here is also where the, the finish vertex call should be. Uh, 
uh, which I somehow left off of that as well. So that's what that, that's how the C code would actually, or the C++ code would actually work for this. Okay. So that's just a quick sort of taster for what one of those looks like and how it came about. Uh, there's, you know, lots more algorithms in there and there's more being added. Um, and so, you know, think twice before sort of implementing your own graph algorithm. You might be able to save yourself some work and, and there might be something already there. Uh, and, you know, it may not, it may take a little bit of thinking, like, you know, it wasn't exactly obvious how to solve this problem uh, using depth first search. You know, there's a little bit of thinking there, and a little bit of like, how do I fit into this existing <coughs> interface? But a lot of times, I mean, these things are pretty maximally generic. Um, if anyone, the complaints that I typically hear about the graph library aren't that it's not generic enough, it's usually that it's too generic or too complicated, okay? So, so it's pretty rare that you can't actually get the job done. 